it's midsummer in the southern hemisphere so it's a great time to talk about density altitude let's get into it <laughs> Density altitude isn't something that you guys and girls flying from close to sea level have to worry about too often, but it does affect us flying from airfields at higher elevations quite a bit, especially in summer. But why is that? What is density altitude? Why should it worry you? And what can you do about it? As you know, the higher above sea level you go, the lower air density gets. Low air density affects aircraft performance in three ways. One, in less dense air, an airplane wing generates less lift at any given airspeed. Two, less dense air is less combustible, meaning naturally aspirated reciprocating engines, or in other words, non turbocharged piston engines make less power. And three, propellers, which work on the same basic principle as a wing, makes less thrust in less dense air. The three performance losses mentioned gets influenced by a single environmental factor, which is air density. And to make things worse, the three factors complement each other, almost like a runaway snowball effect. Let me explain. In less dense air, the wing needs to move through the air faster to generate the same amount of lift compared to more dense air. But the wing will actually end up moving through the air slower because the engine makes less power and the propeller makes less thrust in less dense air. See how it all adds up? So how much does density altitude affect aircraft performance? There are different formulas to calculate density altitude and power loss using either relative humidity or dew point. Using a realistic example, let's say that an airfield you want to take off at is 5000 feet above sea level. It's midday and the temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. The air pressure is 1013 hectopascal and the dew point is 15 degrees Celsius. That brings the density altitude of this airfield to 8059 feet. Using the same variables in the engine tuner calculator, this equates to a relative horsepower of 80.2%. Of course, this isn't going to be 100% accurate. Some sources claim a horsepower loss of 3% for every 1000 feet of altitude gained, which for this example would calculate to a performance loss of 24%. It doesn't matter which method is more accurate. The point is realizing that the power loss is significant. But power loss is not the end of it. At 8,000 feet, the air is roughly 20% less dense than it is at sea level density altitude, which would result in about 20% less thrust after we've already lost 20% of the engine's horsepower. And don't forget, the wing will make less lift as well. The clip I'm about to play shows a typical example of the possible consequences of not considering density altitude in weight and balance calculations. It's an old one on AvWeb's YouTube channel, but still oh so relevant. On August 4th, 2012, this video made it to the internet. What you're about to witness is a plane crash as it was experienced from the right seat inside the cockpit. The accident took place on Saturday, June 30th, 2012. At the time of this report, information was preliminary and subject to change, but some had been collected by the NTSB. The aircraft is a Stinson Model 108-3, generally a 165 horsepower single-engine high-wing propeller-driven aircraft capable of carrying four, plus full fuel and light baggage. The 
an aircraft's performance is dependent, among other things, on the density of the air it moves through. And the aircraft appears to be operating from Bruce Meadows Airstrip, a 5,000-foot-long dirt and grass airstrip situated at an elevation of 6,370 feet, surrounded by 8 and 9,000-foot mountain peaks near the town of Stanley, Idaho. And that may be important. Watch what happens here. What you just saw was the aircraft skipping off the ground after having previously become airborne, only after prolonged ground run. The aircraft seems unwilling to climb. We'll not speculate as to the cause of the crash, but it may nonetheless provide a good example of what pilots call a high-density altitude takeoff. Cold, low-altitude air is more dense. It's thicker than air found at higher altitudes and or higher temperatures. Moisture in the air, humidity, displaces air molecules and also acts to thin the air. For the pilot of a propeller-driven aircraft, thick air has its benefits. It gives the surfaces of the aircraft, the wings, and propeller more to push against, as it were. It gives a naturally aspirated non-turbocharged engine more air molecules to mix with fuel, and that results in higher power output. Relevant to what you're seeing here, the NTSB has collected air data, including barometric pressure, temperature, and moisture for the accident's location on the day of the crash. The figures show that while the aircraft was physically located at an elevation of 6,370 feet, the air around it was as thin as that found at 9,167 feet on a standard day. In other words, compared with a cooler day at a lower altitude, the engine of this aircraft had less air to mix with fuel. It put out less power while the propeller moved less air and produced less thrust. Meanwhile, the wings produced less lift for any given speed over the ground. In practice, that means the aircraft needed more land to get to speed and more speed to create lift, all the while working with less available power. It means it was harder for the aircraft to start to fly. Assuming that the pilot was attempting to climb, this particular aircraft appears strained at best and unwilling at worst. Whatever the cause, this was the result. Like the clip of the crash, it's no wonder why an otherwise great performing aircraft can easily run out of excess power and not be able to clear obstacles taking off from an airfield with high density altitude. Okay, so does this mean that you need to calculate the density altitude every time before you go fly? No, not necessarily, but look out for the three edge factors. Hot, high and humid as those three factors influence density altitude. If the runway you are using is high above sea level then hot and humid conditions should be a red flag and prompt you to check the density altitude. Most modern digital instruments show the density altitude on screen but if you don't have them or you need to get a density altitude forecast I find the easiest way is to calculate it online. The site I use needs four data inputs from you. Airfield elevation, temperature, dew point and air pressure. Airfield elevation you will know and the other three of those can be found on weather apps like Windy and can thus be easily calculated. So what can you do to avoid potentially dangerous situations at high density altitudes? You can do the following keep the aircraft light. Don't go load a four-seater with four people on a hot summer's afternoon. Fly early in the morning when the air is more dense. Other than that, these tips can also help. Use a longer runway, if possible. Lean the mixture for higher altitude. It's unlikely that you would need to use full reach mixture taking off at 8,000 feet density altitude as an example, as that will rob you of a couple of horsepower. Refer to the POH of your specific aircraft for the procedure of leaning before takeoff. Don't be hesitant to abort takeoff. Choose a point on the runway by which you need to have rotated. If you haven't rotated by that point, abort takeoff. As it is with most things, prevention is better than cure. But as a last resort, if you see you're using more runway than usual and can't abort anymore, don't be tempted to pull up early. Build up enough speed before rotating and after liftoff accelerate in ground effect just above the runway as long as possible before starting your climb. Right now, 
For the pilots flying with turbocharged engines, remember that although you won't have the performance loss of normally aspirated engines at high density altitudes, your propeller still makes less thrust and your wing makes less lift, so you're definitely not immune to overall performance loss at high density altitudes.